Hey guys, and welcome back to episode 239 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now, in this episode, I have two guests. I have Margaret Sisson, founder of Riley's Wish, which is a charity helping people affected by OCD and addiction or substance use, uh, and also Dr. Patrick McGrath. And uh, Dr. Patrick McGrath is head of clinical services at OCD. So I got them both on because they're both very passionate about this topic of OCD and substance use disorder or substance use. So I know this is something that affects a lot of people. So I wanted to do an episode in more depth to cover this in detail. We of course have touched on it in the past, but I wanted to honor it by doing another episode. And both Margaret and Patrick are ideally placed to address this. So I interviewed both of them at the same time. So hopefully you enjoy that approach. Uh, But in it, we talk about why they're passionate about helping people people affected by OCD and substance use, how common OCD and substance use are, the stigma surrounding substance use, symptoms of addiction, treating addiction along with OCD, what inpatient treatment looks like or may look like for OCD and substance use, what to do when you're afraid to tell your therapist about substance use, things to consider with medication, words of hope, advice for the family members, and much, much more. Uh, we go into much more detail, so hopefully there's something in there that helps you if you're affected by this or you know someone who is. Thank you to our podcast partners, NoCD. NoCD deliver exposure and response prevention sessions with an OCD-trained therapist directly inside the NoCD platform done over face-to-face video conferencing. In the US, no CD except insurance from insurance companies including Cigna, United Healthcare, Regents, Primera Blue Cross, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, among others. They now operate in more states, including Michigan, California, and North Carolina. If you want to find out more, call no CD's intake team. To find out if they currently take your insurance, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. Their in-app tools and community is free and accessible to all, regardless of location. Simply download the app from the App Store. So there you go. Thanks to NoCD for supporting the podcast. And of course, to you guys for listening. So without further ado, here is Margaret Sisson and Dr. Patrick McGrath. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Patrick McGrath, Head of Clinical Services at NoCD, and Margaret Sisson, founder of the not-for-profit Riley's Wish, which she started to honor the memory of her son, Riley, who was a passionate advocate for people with OCD and addiction. Welcome back to the show, both of you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you, Stu. appreciate it. It's good to have you both here and to talk about this topic. So, um, as, as kind of people would have picked up by now today's topic is going to be on OCD and substance use disorders or are also be interchanging that phrase with addiction which is I'm sure addiction's a more common word for most people um so yeah I guess for those that haven't heard any of the podcasts I've done before with e-review um Margaret and Patrick it'd be good in relation to today's context just to give a bit of background on yourself go ahead Mark okay Hi, um, my name is Margaret Sisson, as Stu has introduced me. Um, I am the executive director of the Riley Wisp Foundation, which I started after I lost my son, who struggled with um, OCD and substance use. Um, Our goal and mission is to educate and raise awareness and help families find um, the correct uh, resources and treatment awesome. in Georgia. <laughs> and I'm Patrick McGrath. I uh, have done a fair amount of things in the OCD and SCD world. I helped open the Foglia Family Foundation Residential Treatment Center, which is at Amita Health in the Chicago area. We were the first residential to treat people who had both co-occurring OCD and substance use disorders. Uh, that continues to go on and is still open. And uh, recently, though, I have transitioned over to working for NoCD, the app for obsessive compulsive disorder, as their head of clinical services, where I'm directing their teletherapy team. Awesome, thank you, guys. And uh, I'll link in the show notes. I've you know I've done a full episode with you, Margaret, and your story and Riley's wish. 
So that, that was a really good one people could listen to and with you, Patrick. I did one recently, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. So how, how well, let me give a, a bit of background. So with uh, addiction or substance use disorders, it's not something I hear about that often, but yet I know it's extremely common. Um, so, yeah, how prevalent or common is uh, addiction with OCD? Well, what we know from the research, and I can thank my friend Stacy Conroy a lot for the work she's done in this area too, is um, we're looking at probably about 30, 35% of people who have OCD who also will at some point in time have a substance use disorder as well. And, and you can think about why that would happen for people who have really intrusive thoughts and don't know it's OCD, who might find that a chemical can really help to calm their brain down a little bit and decrease some of the thoughts that they're experiencing. And you can see why if that works, someone would become addicted to it it over time as their quick fix to try to deal with their obsessions. No, make makes sense. And the, the, I mean, uh, am I fair in saying kind of, because I said it a second ago that it's not something I see, it's not something people talk about. And is that, do you think, just because of shame around the, substance use and i can speak on that as a family member and watching riley Mm -hmm. there is there is a lot of shame in it um and and there's a stigma to it and um and once once that starts and even when you start working with therapists um who uh maybe aren't aware or, you know, they, and what we went through. So I'm going to kind of use, you know, my story, um, which was helping Riley get to the right therapist. We were not able to find people that really understood both um, OCD and addiction. And to be honest, that was probably Riley would hide that. Um, because the shame and he in his mind thought if he could get well get somebody to help him with the ocd maybe the other would go away. obviously that's not that's um but no one ever addressed it and no one ever asked him are you struggling with this and so he i think the shame of it he would not talk to people about it yeah yeah, no, it makes sense why you wouldn't want to. Um, okay, and a question that comes up for me in terms of like what, why it's prevalent or is it kind of like the chicken or the egg? You know, does the addiction come first in a lot of cases or is it the OCD coming first, which kind of drives people, so to speak, towards um, self-medicating with substances? I mean, I've seen it almost always that it's the OCD that comes first and then the self-medicating comes. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual does, of course, have uh, specific diagnoses for like a medication-induced OCD or a substance use OCD, but uh, I would say the vast majority is the OCD comes first and then the quick fix that somebody finds in the use of a substance becomes an addiction over time Mm -hmm. as they continue to try to struggle with how they can handle their obsessions. And, you know, I saw this do a lot from residential where people would come in and it, it, for some people it was their ninth or 10th residential. And, and I would start asking them questions about anxiety or stress or about OCD. And they would say, you know, you're the first person who's ever asked me these questions. I, I never put this together that this might be the reason why I'm drinking. And, and I think sometimes we find that there's a bit of fault in, in, some uh, places that might treat just one or the other, that they're not looking for other things. And since they're missing them, when the person leaves, they're still back out there in the world where they have all of these things attacking them again. So we really have to think about it from a really comprehensive type of treatment program. How are we going to deal with all of the stuff that's going on and not just kind of be siloed into one area? Yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, uh, well, I guess both both of you can speak to this if possible, but what what are the symptoms of addiction? Like, how would someone know when they've got, uh, when they are addicted to something or they're sort of misusing substances? 
Margaret, do you want to take that from the family um, side? Uh, on the family side, uh, that started with Ryan. I mean, I think he was diagnosed with OCD at the age of 12. Mm. So probably what, you know, nine or 10, it was already, you know, he was having uh, intrusive thoughts, et cetera. So um, one, once, once he got through into high school when, and then when he realized, you know, when, when I drink, when I drink, those thoughts go away. Um, and that's, that's when it started. And, uh, and then just continued. And once you go into a college atmosphere, drinking is very prevalent and it's easy to hit his, he wasn't doing his, as social, it was more just for to brag. Hmm. Yeah, and and you know, I think part of that too, Stu, is you know maybe first taking a look at the fact of how easy some of these things are to get for people as well. So, you know that, that there's there's the struggles that people experience, and then uh, like we've kept saying that quick fix that we have, but. You know, you're really looking at how is a person able to function then if they don't have that substance? And are they going into having withdrawal symptoms? And if they are, you know, then overtaking them is going to be that urge to get that substance again, right? And now it might not have anything to do with OCD anymore. It might have taken on a bit of a life of its own. And it's really just gotten to the point that now we have OCD and there's an addiction as well too, right? So uh, it's, it becomes a double-edged sword in some ways. The, the very thing that I do to help myself now becomes the very thing that starts to get in the way, right? And so, you know, if you're looking at like an alcohol use disorder, you've got this pattern um, of, of use that you're taking it in larger amounts over a longer period of time there's a lot of desire or either that are unsuccessful efforts to cut down or stop. So much time is spent in activities trying to get alcohol. Mm. There are cravings and urges to use. The use of alcohol is resulting in the failure to fulfill things that we need to do in life, like work or school or home issues. Um, even when there are interpersonal or social problems caused by the use of it, we continue to use it anyway. Um, we might give up very important things in our life so that we can go ahead and continue to use alcohol. Uh, we might even use it in situations where it's really hazardous, right? That, that could happen for a lot of people in driving or other areas. We might use it despite having knowledge that um, there's a lot of physical problems that this brings about, like what's it doing to my liver or my body or something like that. And then we want to look at two things, tolerance and withdrawal, right? So tolerance is defined either by a need for more of, uh, of the alcohol or the drug to achieve intoxication or the desired effect. Or you notice that there's a diminished effect that you get with it as you continue to use the same amount. So that would be why you would need more. So that's the tolerance piece. And then we have withdrawal. And what is withdrawal? Um, you, you have whole symptoms of, of withdrawal that you're kind of looking at, which are very much substance related. So every, every different substance is going to have their own kind of withdrawal symptom that comes along with it. But let's say that we just specifically looked at alcohol for a, a second. You would see when you stop drinking, two or more of the following things would occur. You would have a lot of hyperactivity autonomically, so sweating, your pulse is up. Uh, you would have tremors, insomnia, nausea or vomiting. There's a lot of visual or tactile or auditory hallucinations that can occur. You can get a lot of psychomotor agitation where it's just very hard to sit still or stay calm and a lot of anxiety. And then there can be seizures as well too, which is why it can be deadly to come off of alcohol. So. As it was a lot there, and you can see how in depth a lot of this is, but um, each, the way that the diagnostic manual is set up, each different kind of substance has its kind of related tolerance and withdrawal concerns that we would look at. Thank you. No, that was very comprehensive. Um, I did have a question around kind of 
uh, how does suds or addiction feed into the OCD cycle? But ultimately, that question could also go the other way. Uh, and you, you kind of addressed it there in the sense of suds can take on a uh, life of its own and then create its own problems, which are no doubt going to spur on the amount of intrusive thoughts someone has and the, the, the stuckness someone has within an OCD cycle. Is that fair to say or is it too simplistic? No, I think that that's a, a, that's a fine explanation for people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so how does... You know, I have OCD, I go to a CBT therapist and I do primarily ERP, but obviously some other CBT tools potentially alongside that. Um, you can throw in some other things, maybe like ACT or Compassion Work, as long as that kind of foundation of ERP is there. But with addiction, is it as simple as, as going to to a CBT therapist or you know, do they need more training in addiction or will some therapists not work with me if I have an addiction? If either of you could kind of speak to that. Well, I think that's a big piece of Riley's story. So Margaret, mm -hmm. I think that that cuts into a lot of what you've had to deal with. So, Yes, um, that's that was a big part of uh, we were in a vicious cycle of you treat the, you know, treating the OCD, but nobody would treat the addiction, then the addiction would would be the, the huge part. Um, and ultimately, you know, the addiction is what killed him. Mm. And was the OCD was there too, but it was um, the addiction that, that took his life. So that is, I think, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased we have, we have, I mean, I'll tell you, from when Riley and I started, you know, he's been gone almost six years now. And, and the, the journey that we went through compared to now, um, and I always want to say thanks to Patrick because he recognized the problems and he recognized the need. And, and we do have places now that recognize that recognize that addiction and, um, is very prevalent. And if we start looking at the numbers, it is high and probably not even still a lot of people don't um, don't tell therapists because they're afraid that they won't get the treatment. So we still have some work to do, um, but I think we're, we're in a much better place compared to the, the journey I, I went on with Riley. Yeah. And I can say from the clinical side, Stu, you know, um, it, it is difficult to find people who will specialize in mental health and in addiction. Uh, I can speak from my own graduate school experience where uh, I took an addiction class as an elective because I thought it was important to learn about, but it wasn't a required class to take in either my master's or my doctorate program in clinical psychology. And I'm hoping that that will change. And I crusade a lot about getting schools to change that because we are missing out if we are deluding ourselves into thinking that the patients who are coming into our office don't dabble in substances and have no substance issues whatsoever we're we're missing at least of the third of the problem of our patients and so we need to learn about it we need to be trained in it if we're not then we need to align ourselves with someone who is trained in it and then share that patient with that person get a release between uh, the two therapists so that we are treating the whole person and not just half of what's going on yeah no a very very good point and i guess for for people listening that maybe have addiction and ocd it would be yeah, trying to find a therapist who has both skill sets or a therapist who has a team around them and one of those team members is an addiction specialist or mm -hmm. is it that that's sort of the starting point, do you think? Yeah, either that or even if they're not on the team, that they're willing to work with someone who's an addiction specialist. I mean, that that in and of itself would be great. But, you know, I, I know when Margaret and I have talked about Riley's journey into going to residentials and and how difficult it was because they wanted to just treat one part of the problem 
And that's what led to difficulties for Riley is they weren't treating him as a whole person. Yeah. Is that, so Margaret, did you have something to add to that? Well, I'll, I so agree when I, as I listened to Patrick, I, I'm, I'm thinking through that pattern and how that happened. And we would not, when Riley would fill out the applications, he would not even, you know, it was never mentioned. I don't even know if they asked, but he certainly did acknowledge, didn't acknowledge it. And I oh, now think, and, and as a parent, I didn't want to say anything either because then he wouldn't get in the residential for, to treat the OCD. So it was just that vicious cycle. And, and, and then, you know, once you get in, um, and I don't know, you know, once they start treating and if they treat him and don't acknowledge and don't ever ask, I mean, I think that's so simple that, that therapists can ask and say, you know what, it's okay to tell me. Mm -hmm. And if you are struggling that with that, we're going to, we're going to get you help. I'm not an expert in it, but boy, I have resources for you. So, cause Otherwise, someone feels so hopeless if they're struggling with addiction and OCD. Mm. So it's it's kind of just a simple, it's okay to tell me. Let's talk about that. And how is that affecting your life? And, you know, what, wow, what a difference that would have made for us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, yeah. It's kind of an acceptance of... But yeah, an acceptance that the addiction exists because it's 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 understandable why many people have an addiction alongside OCD or any other uh, psychiatric illness because sure. it can kind of drive you. And I think I hope most therapists kind of have that understanding of no wonder, you know, it's okay. Like there's no shame here. But yeah, yeah, I, and and I keep pushing for that, and you know things that we've done at various conferences and talks that we've done with Margaret and Stacy and, and others have really been trying to bring it out into the open so that there isn't shame about the fact that, you know, hey, I chose to treat my OCD with a substance versus I chose to treat my own OCD with eight hours of rituals a day. You know, there's there's not a lot of difference between those two things in many ways, right? I mean, they're they're both seeking out immediate relief for somebody, and so let's let's come up with treatments for all of those immediate reliefs and not just not just one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Patrick, you were you when you were at Amita Health, you know, the, your a clinic there was working with uh, addiction and OCD side by side. Yeah. What what was the treatment kind of program like for someone who was there or goes there now? Sure. Well, um, it, it is really an immersive program for both. So there's programming with people who are there for addictions because there's some people who are just anxiety disorders and there's some people who are just addictions. And then there's the people who have both. So we come up with a program every day for people to be able to get both of those treatments. So you might spend the morning doing some of the groups with the addiction side. And then the afternoon, you might be doing exposure and response prevention therapy exercises on the anxiety side. So it really is a tailored program for each person to see where do they need the most help and what can we do with the time frame we have available for them to get them the most amount of exposure and response prevention and maintenance of sobriety yeah thank you um so the next question that comes up for me for both of you is uh so chrissy hodges uh asked me to ask this uh she she uh, wrote the question so she said if i struggle with addiction and i'm afraid my therapist won't work with me uh i, I can't take that risk so do i tell the truth like i have an addiction to addiction problem or or do i lie to them and just you know kind of margaret as you were saying with the with the forms because you knew that you'd get kind of kicked out of those inpatient clinics if you put addiction on um yeah i guess do they take the risk or do they yeah well and 
look what happened with the risk with Riley. So, um, and that should never be what happens with somebody who is trying to get help and they can't be honest Mm -hmm. and say, this is what I'm, because it's the whole person, you know, and and there's co-occurring in all different, whether it be addiction, but there's all different kind of co-occurring and, and substance use is one of them. And if you ignore that and a person isn't, um, feel shamed or uncomfortable or feel like they won't get help, you're defeating the purpose to help someone. And mm-hmm. I think. Margaret, I remember being with you at one of the first Riley's wish lectures down in Atlanta and there was another speaker and forgive me for not remembering his name now, but his line was, um, everyone has co-occurring disorders. If you have anxiety and depression, you have a co-occurring disorder, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I've always, ever since he said that, I've thought about that all the time that I don't, I don't treat anyone in that isolation anymore. And Stu, to get to your question and thank you, Chrissy Hodges, my, our good, our big haired friend over there. Um, <laughs> um you know what? I want I want patients to be honest with their therapist no matter what, right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I think that a diagnostic evaluation with a therapist isn't just the therapist asking questions, but it ought to be the patient asking questions too. And if there's a therapist who's intimidated by the, the fact that a patient's asking them questions of, will you treat me even if I have an addiction? And are you comfortable with this type of OCD? Those should all be on the table. And I hope that patients are going to become more and more comfortable of advocating for themselves in finding the right therapist to meet with them and not waste time with somebody for weeks or months or years even getting the wrong kind of therapy or not the full therapy that they need because that's just a waste of time and money for that patient yeah absolutely so agree so agree yes yeah no thank you and um you know that was going back to riley margaret with uh, some of those inpatient places, I won't name any, but that that was probably what eight years ago you were going through that process. Um, mm-hmm. Have they changed their policies now, or is it still the same? Um, <laughs> I can edit this if it's too controversial. You, um, I don't think um, those programs treat co-occurring addiction and OCD and still don't. I, I can tell you from my angle, those programs would call me at Amita and say, we got somebody who has co-occurring disorders. We're going to send them to you. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, so now at least now we have somebody, but yeah. I went through, we didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. So, and yeah, sorry to hear that, you know, um, I'm trying to think like, I can't even speak too much from the UK's perspective because I I would like to think we approach both simultaneously, but I can't speak to whether we do. Uh, and I'm not sure what Canada does or Australia or anyone else. Um, but yeah, from an American point of view, thank you for explaining. Um, okay. And I can yeah. and I can say, Stu, when, when I did, when Patrick and I did the Riley Wish lecture up there and we had a huge turnout of therapists there were many that came up to me after and said you know what? i i really didn't think about that mm-hmm. um and you know and they'll say you know i did have somebody but that's not up on the and I, i'm hoping it'll be on the forefront and that that's a question that the therapists just ask when they do that first and that the client someone coming in for help can say are you okay? Because this, like Patrick said, this is what I struggle with. Because if you don't treat uh, the addiction, you're going to be in that vicious cycle, yeah. and you're, you know, not going to get better. And our, and our hope is to help the help people and give them the tools that when they, that whether they're in residential or they're just seeing a therapist, that they're going to have the tools to be able to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. And I I think what's coming to me is, you know, you said with those people come up to Margaret at the end of your talk and, uh, the the clinicians and they were saying, you know, we just didn't realize or didn't think about it. And, um, 
And Patrick, earlier you said about, you know, you took the choice to do the addiction class, but <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't mandatory. And thinking about mm-hmm. my master's degree now, like I really love my training. I think it's been very thorough. Uh, but addiction really hasn't been a part of it. Right. Um, and I mean, we are mainly working with children from age four to 18. And obviously you can get addiction in that age period, but maybe they think yeah, it's not as important in teen years when maybe that's when but we it should is. be. Yeah, I know. Oh I agree. my gosh, it is. <laughs> I that's agree. when it starts. Yeah. That's yeah. when it starts. Yeah. So I don't want to bash my course too much because they're wonderful. But yeah, I think yeah. maybe it's, it's, a, it's a wider thing of globally, it's just not given the respect it maybe is deserve, deserves. Well, think of it this way, Stu. In medical school, it would be an outrage to people if they went to their doctor and their doctor didn't have knowledge of, of half or maybe, well, let's say a third of the problems that would be going on with the people coming in to see them. So if, you know, if we know that substance use disorders are huge, I mean, look at the death rate that we have from heroin across the globe and opioids and things mm-hmm. like that, right? And Margaret, you know this all too well with fentanyl and Riley and, and everything. Mm-hmm. So look at, look at the fact that we have this many people dying. We know that the life expectancy in the United States for the previous two years actually went down 0.1 per year because of the opioid deaths that we have. Mm-hmm. And we are training people to deal with the health of, of our population, but we're saying, we're only going to do this part of it. We're not going to do this part of it. And I just think it's ridiculous. Yeah. Fair point. <sighs> yeah. yeah. I'll sigh. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. A question, you know, we discussed before this COVID, so coronavirus. Um, I've heard of it. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> we're kind of on the tail end now and I hope it stays that way or, you know, drops off obviously more. It doesn't kind of peak again. Uh, but what do we think this has done for people with OCD and um, substance use disorder during this time? Margaret, you want to take that? And, and Pat, you know, I'm hearing and, and talking to people, and, you know, who... When you're quarantined, um, you're not having, and whether you, you know, you, your maybe your help was either a smart recovery or an AA program, and now you're not getting out to see that, and that was keeping you, you know, it was that social interaction. So there's that that self isolation that. And nothing worse that if you talk to someone who struggles with alcohol, when they find themselves drinking by themselves all the time. So I'll guarantee you there are a lot of relapses from from this um, quarantine and self-isolation. I'm wondering how, and I think we have to look how going forward with this, um, I think we're going to have a huge, um, huge upswing in mental health and um, with with uh, substance use. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, at least at the beginning, it was really rough for people with addictions who had just lost the ability to go to their meetings if they relied on meetings and, and that group camaraderie. And though a lot of meetings might be happening now online, you know there's people who just struggle with technology or don't have access to the technology sometimes that they need for that as well too. So there's a lot of those people who then suffer because of that. And in terms of obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, I'll say from the no CD perspective, um, we have, we have seen huge increases in people calling us and seeking out treatment. So, um, if if we have to find a silver lining in this entire experience, I think that it will be is that more and more clinicians have embraced the concept of telehealth, which allows for people across all areas of all countries to get the treatment that they need and not just people who are within an hour drive of a specialist. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, and what hit me, this hit me like a month ago was um, 
a month of recording this anyone listening to this it would have hit me about four months ago but the uh, I just thought that you know mental health aside the, I, I predict a huge upswing in at least alcohol addiction in my own country uh, because even like even if they're not self-medicating if they're drinking out of boredom and it's alcohol is fairly popular in this country uh people are, you know there's nothing else to do especially if they live furloughed it becomes a habit habit becomes an addiction um yeah so i just hope the country uh, all countries are kind of prepared for the potential of that well and i think that's um you know and even not with ocd just people with being isolated and and then the uncertainties um yeah. even if you don't have ocd the uncertainties of maybe your job uh your business what things look for well what will you what will help what will you think help you if you're isolated well you start drinking yeah and and that eases the worry because you don't know the next day you know, uh, oh, will I have a job or am I going to be furloughed or gonna, am I going to be let go? You know, how, how will I deal with that? So what would people do? Certainly. And I think some of it, you know, you, if people start drinking, they drink more amounts than what Patrick was ta- talking about, you know, their tolerance increases and then they need more and, you know, that's and th- and then they're isolated. Um, so, well, and to add to that too, not only people who have lost their jobs, but for the people who have had that and have OCD who are now isolated, what used to be maybe a distraction at times, going to work, interacting with people, and maybe you know you could you could utilize all that time as a way to kind of distract a little bit from your thoughts. Now that you're home and if you're furloughed and you have nothing else to do, there's no distractions anymore. So that OCD is just going to be running rampant then at all mm-hmm. times kind of mm-hmm. going because you've lost that. So you can see why people then would turn to substances as a way to try to, you know, calm that brain down a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so... Uh, w- I'll bring this up um, because sometimes it can be a debate and that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. I just want to raise it for anyone who's considering either path. Um, You know, with reducing or stopping alcohol, I say alcohol, I mean any substance, there's harm reduction as a strategy and then there's abstinence. Maybe there's other strategies, but I'm ignorant to them. I don't know them. Uh, Yeah, so maybe just talk to what those two strategies are and... Uh, pros and cons, I guess. Yeah. And Patrick, I mean, I think we both have, and Patrick can talk on the the medical side. For the, you know, I think if somebody um, is drinking and maybe they have increased their alcohol, but say, okay, I'm drinking too much, I'm backing off, but if they can't do that and it is affecting their life, their job, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, absence is if you have, if, if, if it is changing your life or, or hurting your, your life, then absence is, I, I'm going to say it will be, should be a big part of someone. So, uh, you know, you can speak more on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of go along with that, Margaret, too. Stu, um, imagine imagine saying to someone with OCD, um, you can do some rituals, right? <laughs> what do you think would happen? Yeah, they'd do lots. <laughs> right. So um, I think that the difference becomes, and, and maybe there's that turning point, and Margaret was alluding to this, and I, I kind of agree with her. For people who notice that there is that increase in, in substance use and, and are able to say before it becomes really an addiction, boy, I really need to stop this, or I really need to really decrease this, and I'm going to commit to no more than two drinks a day or, or whatever it might be. Um, if, if they have the power to do that, good on them. But for those people who, once they use that, that switch is flipped and it's like oh, one can of beer equals 24 cans of beer kind of yeah. thing. Uh, 
addiction is so powerful that it seems that abstinence looks to be the best way to manage that for, for those folks. Just like, again, I, I've never said to someone, now, now that you've finished with the OCD program, you can do several rituals a day without a problem. I, you know, we talk about uh, no rituals, right? No rituals. That's what we want. Hmm. Yeah, no, good, good point. Um, and on abstinence, uh, what are your take on programs like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous? Margaret, do you want to jump on that? Um, you know what? I think you need to find what fits you. Mm -hmm. uh, AA is a, is a wonderful program for them. I've, uh, is it uh, Smart? Smart recovery recovery. Yep. seems to be a really popular one. Um, and I, I think it's so individual. Um, yep. that you've got to find what, what fits you. Um, and there's Stu, there's so many other great treatments available now too. There's also medication assisted treatments that are available for people. So yeah. there's, uh, there's lots of stuff that's coming out, I think, that we'll see in the next two to five years as well that will will be other things. And, and you, Margaret's right. You have to kind of decide what really works for you. And part of the issue with that is, is that it depends on what kind of group you might go to. You know, some of, uh, as as some relatives of mine who, who attend some of those groups, <laughs> I can say, um, would say, you know, there's some of the old timer groups who are like, you can't even be on Prozac. Uh, that that's a drug, you know. Yeah. And then, and then there's some of the younger groups that just say, hey, you know what? Congratulations, you're taking the Vivitrol shot so that you don't get high on heroin anymore. That's great, and we're gonna we're gonna be accepting of you that that's the route that you've taken, and as long as you're not being addicted anymore. So, I think that the recovery community also has. It's, it's levels of people who are really, really strict about the way that it's supposed to be. And then there's other people who are much more open. And so you really do have to do your own exploring to find where do you fit within the recovery community. I agree. Yeah, really, really good points. Um, yeah, there, there's always evidence for things and you've got to trust in the evidence. But also, as Margaret says, you've got to trust in yourself and find the, the route that works for you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, like you said, some some paths are going to be much more rigid than others, and mm -hmm. if you, that may just completely put you off, and if you can't adhere to it, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, yeah, next question was on um, medication. So obviously, as I said to you guys at the start, neither, neither of you are medical doctors, um, so you can't advise anyone necessarily. But it was more just things people should watch out for when it comes to medication for OCD if they have an addiction and just maybe things they should be asking or talking about to their fer uh, sorry, psychiatrist. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing that we've always talked about either with substances, if they're uh, not prescribed or even some that are prescribed is do those substances interfere with the process of exposure and response prevention therapy, which is the main, of course, treatment that we utilize for obsessive compulsive disorder? So if you look at, at um, if somebody comes into my office or if I'm doing teletherapy now and, and they say, all right, I'm ready to do exposures. I just took a Xanax. I'm really calm and I'm ready to go. I'm going to say to them, you know what, we're not going to do ERP right now. And the reason why is that if we do ERP right now, after having taken that substance, what you're going to discover is it's really easy to do the ERP. And you're going to learn, if I want this to go easy, take a substance before I do the ERP, and then it'll be really easy to do. And ERP, of course, as you know, isn't designed to be easy. It's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be uncomfortable because that's where you learn how to handle things. So you start to get what we call state-dependent learning. I learn how to handle the discomfort I'm in based on the state that I'm in, right? And if I'm not in that state, then I don't know how to handle that discomfort anymore. So then I have to be back in that state in order to handle that discomfort. So if I learn how to do all my ERP exercises while in benzos, then it doesn't translate to when I'm not on benzos. And then what do I need to do? I need to take more benzos. So that becomes the biggest issue, I think, in 
what it is that people get prescribed. So it can be frustrating because, at least from the United States, the American Psychiatric Association guidelines for OCD are exposure and response prevention or exposure and response prevention plus medication. But that medication isn't a benzodiazepine medication. That benzo that medication is like an SSRI or an SNRI. So it, we just want to make sure that people are jumping right to anti-anxiety drugs because those anti-anxiety drugs can get in our way of doing the therapy that we need to do, which we know is the main component of treatment for people with obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'll speak on that with the uh, with benzos. Um, if you um, struggle with a, an addiction, and that's a and with Riley, and and I've said the story. He'd say, "Oh yeah," when when he was sober, he'd say, "Oh yeah," I said I'd just have one beer. I can do that, and then the next day I'd have just two, and the third day, once it got going, I'd have 50, and then I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And that, the benzos became a part of that. If he, if, whenever a doctor put him on um, a benzo, it set his mind into that addiction craving, and he mm -hmm. couldn't, just couldn't stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's people that that can be on a benzo and and do fine and they don't have that addictive. They're not an either an addict or an alcoholic, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And and all that. But that goes back to what we were saying, that if people um, if if the therapist or the residential isn't aware that that person and that struggles with this, um, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to be bad news. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I guess it, going back to what we were saying earlier around if people, you know, are ashamed and, and aren't speaking up for fear or fear of stigma or fear of rejection of therapy. And then, and obviously they're not, they're not medical doctors. They don't necessarily know the side effects or damages or, implications of certain medications so then they could get prescribed something like a benzodiazepine which isn't right for them potentially and it's kind of a vicious circle because mm -hmm. obviously right. the medical doctor isn't aware that they have addiction because they haven't said they have addiction or they haven't asked the right questions of the person to get that information out of them mm -hmm. yeah okay um so next one is I guess from both of you, just words of hope or words of advice for those uh, who have both OCD and uh, substance use disorder. Well, I'll, I'll start that because, Margaret, you're going to give much more inspirational things than I am. So uh, we'll, we'll end on that note. But I would just like to say that uh, there are treatment centers now that are available. You know, when, when we opened Foglia, part of Amita Health, uh, we were really excited that we were bringing something new into the, into the market where uh, there just wasn't something before. And um, the same thing, I think, with the hope of teletherapy and the work that I do with NoCD is that to see the, the broad range of therapy available to more people now through teletherapy is just heartwarming and exciting all at the same time. So I love the fact that we've seen a broadening of treatment and I hope that that continues. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and I will always, always, always reiterate and, and maybe that was hard for me um, with my story with Riley. I thought how, you know, unfortunately I lost him. Mm. But through the advocacy work and, and the people I'm meeting, I'm so hopeful and I'm so grateful that we're making, we're making changes. I mean, if you look back eight years from n none of these, you know, Fogley wasn't there, uh, NOCD, I mean, <laughs> you telling your story, you 
allowing people to tell your story, Stu, on, on this podcast, Chrissy telling her story and, and, you know, none of that was here. So I'm, I'm super hopeful. I think, um, I think we all keep moving forward and, and we continue to make changes. Is everything perfect? No, but I think we've made huge strides and I think we're helping a lot of people. And I think if we can continue with that uh, dialogue of about the, about stigma, because if you, if you won't recognize that you're, you're uh, as a therapist, you're, um, you're not going to help someone. So I think the more we, we talk about that, the more therapists will understand and not, and, and I understand it, it can be scary and it can be, and they'll think, well, I don't know anything about addiction. I just treat this, but if they will expand their knowledge, I think it will help. And, um, I, I see that happening. So, um, I'm very hopeful. Awesome. No, good words. Uh, next question is very similar, but it's for the family members. So, uh, Margaret, for you, it'd be good to answer it from, from being a family member. And uh, Patrick, for you, just anything from a clinical point of view uh, families can do to help their loved ones of OCD and addiction? Sure. Um, well, number one is support. I mean, you let's not put someone down for having OCD and let's not put someone down for having a substance use issue as well, right? So let's take a look at the fact that it's not like anybody wanted to develop a substance use disorder. You know, no, no one started drinking thinking, you know, I hope one day I become addicted to this. That would be great. And no one wanted to have uh, OCD either. So it, when, when we can get away from the idea that you made this happen, you caused it to happen, this is your fault too, what can I do to support you and help you so that this doesn't take over your life again and become a problem? Mm -hmm. I think we're going to do really good things with people. Awesome. Yes. And uh, I agree. I just agree with, with Patrick. I, I remember Riley, how shameful he felt himself and, and that self shame because Riley was smart and bright and had so many things he wanted to do in life and addiction would take over and then he would do things that made him feel horrible and he, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So no one ever wants to be, to deal with that. And, um, and I think if, if you recognize that and have empathy and, and understand that that person doesn't be, they're struggling with a disease, um, and um, and also, and this is there's a hard and a and a balance there of a family member with somebody that does struggle with addiction that um, that enabling. Mm. I, I try to help families often that enable that person, um, which is only harmful for them in the in the long run. So there's, but there's a balance. There's a balance of support. There's also that imbalance, that balance of not enabling and, and letting a person just continue his behavior because it's not going to help him or her. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you, Margaret and Patrick. Uh, <laughs> slight change of speed. So um, you've both got a billboard uh, one in Chicago, one in uh, Georgia. What do you want written on those billboards? Oh, uh, that's always the question. <laughs> um, I would think hope. there is hope because so many people think that they can't make it their day and that there's not a possibility so that would be mine i think mine would say uh something along the lines of you're not alone you're not the only one yes absolutely uh and then lastly from both of you is there anything else that you wish you could have said today I'm just always thankful to be able to be with my friend Margaret and Stu. Uh, thank you much because, you know, 
we need more people like Margaret in the world who are telling their stories and who are bringing this to the forefront because uh, we can teach it in classes, hopefully if people go to the classes or if they offer the classes. But I think that, like Margaret said, those therapists that came up to her after we did that talk in Chicago who were all saying to her, I missed it, I missed it. It's that personal touch that really touches people and gets them to to change. And so I always appreciate doing this work with Margaret because I get to watch her help people make that change, whether they are a family member or whether they're a therapist. When they hear the story of Riley, um, you know, and I, I, I'm her loyal sidekick in this, but when they hear the story of Riley, they, it touches their heart and, and they, they start to look at things differently from that point forward. So that's always exciting for me. Um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. That's, um, that's very humbling. Um, I'm through this journey and, and not that I would, you know, I told you if I changed it, but I can't. So I go forward and, and that's this silver lining of meeting all these people that are making changes and helping, uh, fuels me every day. And, you know, I always thought it would be Riley doing the advocacy and I'd be, you know, be his cheerleader and saying way to go. And, um, so I, I never thought I'd be in this position, but, um, through that, I have met so many incredible people that uh, are are helping and and making a difference. And to me, you know, at the end of the day, that's I think that's what we're supposed to do. So, so thank you to all of y'all, and thank you, Stu, for your continuous. These OCD stories are just uh, an inspiration, and um, I appreciate that you do them every single time. Absolutely. That's my pleasure, guys. And thank you so much for your time and shedding light on this important topic. So there you have it. Thank you, as always, to my guests, Margaret Sisson and Dr. Patrick McGrath. Uh, thank you to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And uh, don't forget, today's episode is sponsored by NoCD. To find out more about NoCD and their therapy plans, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories. Or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.